to the Touchstone Exploration uh, uh, webcast this evening. Um, this is really a follow-up to the release of our our um, uh, year-end 2018 results, which we put up. I'll, I'll touch on those a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Paul Bay, uh, CEO. Uh, tonight, I also have James Shipka, our Chief Operating Officer, with us, and I'll I'll pass this over to James a little bit later uh, to walk through a little bit more detail about the exploration program. Uh, really excited to talk about three things tonight. One will be the financial results from last year. Uh, the second thing that we'll touch on will be the development drilling program that we did in 2018 and how it's uh, how it's worked really well um, and where we're at today on it. And then uh, the last part will be the exploration and the development program that we have laid out for 2019. So on that basis, we still remain our goal is to be the largest and most profitable onshore producer in Trinidad. I think we moved up the ranks a couple of notches this year. There's, uh, we're probably third or fourth um, with certainly uh, Shell and Heritage, who's the old Petrotrin, being ahead of us, and then a couple of us that are, are sitting in that, that range where we are today of about 2,200 barrels a day of oil production. Um, so what I'd like to do tonight is uh, start out, and I'll, I know a number of you have probably heard this um, before, but I'd like to give a little background for any of those that are on the line that um, are seeing this for the first time. Basically, Touchstone started uh, in 2010 with about 130 barrels a day in a single property in Trinidad. And as I mentioned today, we're at about 2,200. You can see how that's growing through 2019 with our sales in uh, in January and February. We're 1,900 and just over 2,100 for the corresponding months. We're dual listed on both Toronto and on AIM. We list on AIM a little less than two years ago. And it's really, really enhanced our liquidity. And uh, I think our stories. Um, being well accepted in in the market uh, on both uh, at both TX uh, both Toronto and in in London. Um, right now, our market capitalization is about 33, 34 million dollars, and I think you'll see today, especially with the exploration program, how we think that um, if things work out uh, the way we hope they do in 2019, we should see a a marketable change in that that market capitalization as we go forward. In 2018, um, our funds flow from operations was 10.8 million. That's part of the release that we put out this morning. I think what's more important is comparing it to 2017, where we had just over $3 million of funds flow. So, you know, almost a three times increase uh, year over year. Uh, talk about Trinidad in general. It's, you know, obviously right off the coast of Venezuela. Um, it's in a very oil prone and gas prone hydrocarbon basin. And James will talk a little bit more about that. Um, on the exploration side, how we see some new opportunities that have come about in the last uh, last year or two, and, and we're going to finally get a chance to drill those this year. Um, the uh, the strategy that we have is is uh, I think very simple. It's really broken down into two components. The first one is what we call scalable economic growth, or really our development program, um, and this is what we've been focusing on for a number of years. We've got 19 blocks on shore, 10 of those are producing, and James and his team have identified 200 drilling locations, which gives us somewhere between a 15 and 20 year inventory of drilling locations. We've learned a lot of things in, the, in what we've drilled up in 60 plus wells since we've been in the country. And I think what you'll see a little later on in the presentation is we're really starting to understand the geology and the engineering on how these wells should be produced and starting to really see the benefits of that. On the exploration upside, um, this is new to the story in the last year, year and a half. Uh, we started to look at some of the deeper horizons, some of our undeveloped blocks that we had, and specifically looking at a block on the east end of the island called Oratois, where we've identified some, I think, our world-class uh, exploration opportunities that, again, James will talk, uh, talk about a little bit later in the, in the presentation. All of that combined, uh, we think, creates um, Creates value uh, for uh, for the shareholders um, if we can have this combination of these low risk development wells and then uh, the higher risk exploration that can make some step changes. If I go into slide five, um, basically what we have is our our summary of the numbers that we put out this morning, comparing 2017 to 2019. I already talked about the increase in the funds flow, uh, but uh, the other thing I'd like to just focus in on would be that last line on the top section, um, which is the capital expenditures program. We spent $22 million last year versus nine the year before. And that was really a combination of higher cash flow, so we had more money to spend, but also because we were able to access the markets in London, 
uh, to ramp up our capital program. So we were we, we had a very aggressive capital program. The other thing um, where I click off of here would be the operating net backs. You can see they moved up from $22.56 to $34.58. And a big chunk of that is because we've got a bunch of fixed costs in Trinidad and, and, in, and in our head office that as the production volumes move up, uh, those fixed costs get spread over a much larger uh, production base. So we get much higher net backs in, in what we're looking at doing. So all in all, we think it was a, a good year. Um, I guess before I run away, I should also mention it was our first year of having positive earnings. Uh, and I think that's also something that you're going to see more and more of as we move forward. The next chart is um, our performance uh, since we went public on AIM. And you know, I, we've been showing this chart since day one, and uh, certainly it looked a lot better back in October and November. Um, we saw oil price take a dramatic, dramatic downturn uh, as we headed into um, the end of the year. We also saw a great deal of uncertainty, I think, in all of the Trinidad stocks. And part of that was because Petrotrin, the Crown Corporation, restructured itself. It basically broke itself up into four um, four different entities, and uh, that presented a lot of uncertainty. So I think the combination of of things really forced a lot of pressure on the uh, stock at the end of the year. It has recovered somewhat, um, but we think with what we're seeing on the financial side and on the expiration side, uh, it's going to be a good good year for us in 2019. Um, just to touch on Trinidad just briefly for any of those that are new to the story, but it is, as I mentioned, a hydrocarbon rich uh, country, about 3 billion barrels of oil um, that uh, uh, that's actually been produced uh, to date and lots more left to produce. It's the eighth largest LNG producer in the world and they've been producing down here in, for over a hundred years. And you can also see its proximity there to, um, to Venezuela. So it's obviously in the, the right postal code for, for um, uh, production as we go forward. You know, it's a fairly uh, friendly environment from a regulatory basis and I think a big chunk of that is just because they've been in the business so long, they understand it. So a lot of the regulations are in place, and we can actually move very quickly on things in Trinidad. Uh, the next thing to talk about is the the development and the exploration side, and really um, the productions on the south end of the island on this map that you can see, and on the uh, southwest or side of the um, island is really our development program. That's where we've been doing all of our drilling. And on the east side of the island is the big Oratois block that. After four or five years of really good technical work, we're now going to be putting the bit in the ground and and um, hopefully proving up the concepts that uh, that we put forward. And again, I'll let James talk a little bit more about that. But I think the key thing that the key takeaway from this particular slide, and and I'll let everybody read the numbers on their own, is the prospects that we're drilling on the east side of the island basically individually are as large as uh, or could potentially be as large as our entire production base that we have right now. So when I talk about step changes, that's the magnitude of, of what we're talking about. I'll just touch quickly on the development program. Um, and really the, the key here is that, you know, we've got these blocks, there's very large oil in place. We started out in 2017 after we did the IPO in London. I took some of that capital, drilled four wells that, that worked out exceptionally well, gave us the confidence to ramp up the program in 2018 to 11 wells. Getting a lot of questions about when we're going to get back in the field and start drilling those development wells again. Uh, I think the answer is we want to make sure commodity prices stay fairly stable, which they, they seem to be in that, that range they're in right now. We also want to make sure that we allocate capital properly. We really want to get um, as many of those exploration wells drilled as we can this year. So uh, the balance here is we'll get back in the field once we know firm costs and everything else on the uh, on the program out in uh, out in Oratois. I'm not talking about months. This is something that uh, that will happen over the next uh, next period of weeks. So um, you know it shouldn't be something that waits for a long time. But taking a look at that program, uh, I think this is really the graph that that we're all most proud of, and that's really how production is built. At least since uh, June of 2017, when we went public, uh, we did that initial program of the four wells in 2017. You can see that production wedge and then the additional production wedge from 2018 wells, which now has us at about 2,200 barrels a day, which is a you know, long ways from where we've come in the last couple of years. But I think it also shows how quickly we can grow production um, in Trinidad once we had the capital and we were able to, to do what we needed to do out there. 
Um, but not only are we growing the production quickly, we also like to think that we're doing it in a real economic manner. And uh, if you take a look, originally when we were drilling in here and Scott and the, the team were using in their model about a 50 barrel a day um, sort of IP, and these are run at a, a no decline basis. But if you use that model and you say $65 oil, we had uh, basically just over a two year payout on the wells. And what we're now seeing is that the last series of wells that we've drilled are more in that range of about 90 barrels a day. And if you take a look at that, it's $65. Uh, you're, you're in under two years, you're about 15 months for the payout on those particular wells. I think this is really critical because I, I, I think a lot of times the program tends to get focused a little bit more on the exploration side right now because it's so exciting. Um, but we can't forget about our core business, which is these development wells, which we've done a really good job of identifying uh, areas of the reservoir that hasn't, have not been drained and, and given us the opportunity. So I want to make sure that we keep a balance between the two uh, because this is really our bread and butter in, uh, in what we do. Um, we talked about wanting to become the biggest operator and most profitable in Trinidad. I think we crossed a bigger hurdle on that last year. Uh, we drilled more wells than anybody else on shore in Trinidad last year. And I, I think that'll happen again this year. Um, we may start a little bit later in the year, um, but, but we're going to get a bunch of wells drilled, especially if commodity prices continue to kind of stay where they're at right now. So what I'd like to I'm gonna slide James in here uh, to talk about the uh, Oratwa exploration block because um, it's coming up real quick and, and I think it's going to be pretty exciting. And then I'll get James to pass it back to me at the end and he and I will both answer some questions. So James, take it away. Thanks, Paul. Um, I know Paul is, if you've been following Paul's podcast here, his, his videos, you've seen uh, him talk about some of these prospects we have on the Oracle block. And what's been really great since we first introduced this to everyone about a year ago is we've got a lot more detail. We've been able to put a lot more technical work into it. And we're at the point now where we've gone from prospects to locations. Um, we've talked in the past about the Coruscant gas prospect. We will be drilling our first well there called Coho 1, and we expect to spud that in uh, the first week of June of this year. That'll be an 8,500 foot well targeting an oil, or a, pardon me, a gas prospect there on the block. Uh, that will be followed by a well called Cascadero 1 on the western prospect, which is an oil target at about 8,200 feet TD. And then the third well we've talked about uh, in the past on that central block, which is the really the big gas prospect, is our, our Royston 1 location. What's happened here is we've had an opportunity to have our uh, technical team dig in. We found some new 3D seismic we've been able to go through, done some data sharing, and the ministry got some more information. And what we've seen is not only validated our, our overall concept, but it's really given us a little bit more detail. And we're at the point now where we're going to really get after these and, uh, and get moving. Um, you know, I think Paul has spoken in the past about what are called uh, CECs or Certificate of Environmental Compliance. That is the first step in the licensing of a well. At this point in time, we now have three of the four CECs required to drill these wells in hand. Uh, we expect to have the fourth in the next two weeks. And at that point in time, we'll have all the necessary approvals to start construction. So I think the next thing you'll hear us talk about on these after this introduction in detail today will be that we've started construction on the first locations for Coho 1 and Cascadero 1. Hopefully that'll be in the next week or two. Uh, looking a little bit at the, the Coho 1 prospect, this is a well that offsets uh, a well that was drilled in 2001 by Aventura, where they had a gas discovery, but in the context of Trinidad at the time, they didn't have the infrastructure to put it on production. Uh, in the context also of the, the Carapel Ridge well that they had just drilled, which tested at 108 million a day. This was less than 10 million a day, which by, by anyone's standards an economic well, if you have a gas plant. They didn't have a gas plant at that point in time, so they weren't able to really put that into, uh, into production and in, into action, and they wound up uh, relinquishing that particular portion of the block a couple of years later. We're fortunate now to have that data, and we've been able to tie it into some 3D data that we currently didn't or previously didn't have access to. And what we've identified is an opportunity to come up structure into a thicker section there where it looks like we'll actually have, uh, have more pay there. And there's a little uh, picture there at the bottom of the surface location. I had the opportunity to personally go visit this about two weeks ago. Uh, the access road is, there is an access road into the location. We're going to tidy it up a little bit. Uh, construction there is only going to take about 30 days. So we're, we're well on our way to being able to target on that uh, June 1st spud date. 
With respect to the seismic work we've been able to do, what we've identified is not only the redrill of, of the original Coruscant gas prospect or gas discovery that I showed you, but we've identified a second layer of that uh, turbidite sequence that's immediately beneath it, only about a thousand feet deeper, give or take. So that's probably about two days drilling. So the real concept on this is to drill through that 10 million a day gas prospect to see if there's another 10 or 15 million a day prospect beneath it. Uh, so really excited to be doing that. As Paul mentioned, it is a transfer transformational uh, volume, both with respect to reserves and production associated with it. We had uh, previously renounced in February, our uh, reserve evaluator has looked at these on a risk and unrisk basis, and we've been able to kind of pinpoint kind of the value and uh, the size of the prize here. The next prospect we'll be drilling is the Balado West oil prospect. And this really keys in off of a well called BW5 that was drilled back in 1958. Uh, what's fascinating about this well is they actually just, they, they found oil as they were drilling it. This well has produced about 27,000 barrels over the course of a couple of years. Uh, they drilled in through one sheet of, of hay. They encountered what looked like a second hydrocarbon horizon underneath that that's there on the, the log in the middle of the screen, uh, highlighted in, in green on the bottom part, but they got stuck while they were drilling. That technology was there. They were severely overweight with respect to mud. They were never able to test that, even though they did see signs of oil while drilling. What we've been able to do is look at that and look at the seismic associated with that. And what we've seen is that there is a, a very thick second sheet beneath it. And it actually looks as exciting, if not more exciting, than, than the, the shallow horizon. And what that really means is that we have that low risk uphole zone that we can look at, and we've also got a, a potentially high return zone underneath it that's not going to cost us that much more to investigate. Um, the other great thing about this prospect that's really exciting is it's not a one or a two well field. If we're successful in the evaluation well here, uh, this really does lead to a 30 to 50 well program that's going to span a couple of years and uh, again, be transformational with respect to the impact on production and on, on reserves here. Moving from the Cascadeur location, which would be our second well, so we'll drill Coho, and once we've got uh, the drilling of Coho done, hopefully by mid-July, we'll move over to Cascadeur in August, uh, and then we'll see where we go from there. But the next location that we would be planning on going would be in the uh, central portion. This is a fairly massive appearing gas prospect. Uh, it looks like there could be as much as a TCF of gas here, although on a risk basis that obviously shrinks a great deal. Um, this was initially built by Shell back in the 60s, uh, and again we've been able to look at some new seismic data, compare it to some production that we've seen on, on other blocks, and really kind of pinpoint uh, a target there that, that is a uh, relatively low risk slightly deeper prospect that we'll be looking at there and that will probably be the third well that we would look to be doing in Q4 or maybe Q1 of next year and uh, you know it's it's again a volume and a size that uh, that really hasn't been seen in Trinidad for a long time. I think that's on the exploration side of what uh, what I've got for now so maybe I'll start back with Paul. Sure. Thanks, Jim. Um, just before we run away from this uh, particular exploration side, is this is really phase one of the Oratoa block exploration. So we've identified structures on wells that have been previously drilled. The next phase would then be to go and um, uh, test some of the, the, if these are successful, test some of the anomalies that have never been drilled. Um, that would be the true exploration, as long as it, as well as a development program on Oratoa. If, if you sort of sense um, some excitement in our voice, um, it might be excitement and it might, it might also be nerves. It's one of these things that, you know, we've, we've been talking about it for so long now that we're getting very close to it actually happening here in June. So uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be watching it very closely and, and very, very excited about it. Um, so just to summarize before I answer the questions, really what we've got is we've got this scalable economic uh, uh, development program that we've got in place big reserves, lots of wells to drill, and, and what we've shown is that even as we've drilled more wells, um, they've got better uh, as we understand the reservoir, and, and quite frankly, as we understand how to produce them better as well. And then on the exploration side, um, 
uh, we're coming up to that point again where where we're going to drill these wells and um, and test these these concepts. I, I really also want to emphasize that there are three very different prospects. Like if if the first one doesn't work, it doesn't it doesn't mean two and three don't work. We really need to drill all three of these wells to fully evaluate the concept. Um, as far as the value creation goes, I think we're starting to see uh, us converting reserves to production, which means we're getting cash flow and the net backs are moving up, which also shows that we're becoming more cost effective in what we do. So I'll leave that up on the uh, on the uh, screen there, and then I'll hop in here and start to answer some questions. Um, uh, anybody that wants to uh, submit questions obviously can can do that. They'll show up here and we'll we'll take a look at them. Um, uh, let's just see here. I'll take a look here. Uh, so there was a couple of questions that were submitted in advance. And the first one is, could you please summarize and put into context the chance of discovery figures Touchstone has released about Oratuan? And um, I'm just going to flip back here. So you'll notice in the bottom of, uh, of all of these illustrations that James put up there, there's these chance of success categories. Those aren't generated by us. They were actually generated by our independent third-party engineers. And, and really what we did is we took this concept that we had of the turbidites out in Oratwa to our independent engineers and, and basically said, are we crazy or are we missing something? Or, and we really wanted to have a, a third party look at it. So what they did is they took a look at the data we had, the wells, um, and they had actually done a bunch of evaluations in here for other companies. And then they apply that chance of success on it. So, you know, if you look back at uh, Corazon or what we're now calling Coho, they're saying it's 90%. 95% chance of success. The reason for that is there's already a well in there that's been drilled, tested gas. So, you know, the chances of us getting a dry hole are, are pretty small. But what does change between their low best and high estimate is how big that reservoir is. And uh, that really drives um, those three cases. Now, in the case of uh, Royston, what you'll see in there is they don't actually give us any contingent reserves because that well never tested gas. Unlike BW5 that produced oil and Corazon or Coho which produced gas. Um, this would be more of an exploration in their mind. So you don't actually see uh, contingent reserves. You see those in the, the category. So um, I, I hope that answers the question as best as we can. And they apply a whole bunch of different things in that. James jump in here, but you know they look at uh, reservoir quality, data quality, tests, mud logging, like as much as they can get information as they can get and then and apply a risk factor to it and literally run thousands of combinations of different different factors. Yeah, and specifically with respect to the uh, chance of discovery, you're looking at, uh, is your source rock present? Is it mature? Uh, has it migrated there? Do you have a trap? Do you have a seal? And is the reservoir porous enough to actually be productive? And your chance of discovery is actually the, the arithmetic multiple of all those things. So. Uh, Comfort level is very high on source, maturity, and migration. So there really is just a question of, is there a trap, is there a seal, and is the reservoir capable of delivering, which is what you're going to see on, on any real exploration prospect. So at, the, at about 35%, which is where I think the average comes out, you're really looking at, uh, at something that, for an exploration prospect, is actually uh, relatively low risk. Um, the uh, question is, if drilling at OL4 is a success, how fast can you start producing from the well? And is it correct it could be up to 40 or 50 million cubic feet um, each day? Uh, if OL4 were to come on production, it's about a 13 kilometer pipeline uh, over to the Shell gas plant, which currently has 30 million a day of capacity in it, um, give or take. I think it's running about 50 million cubic feet a day, and, and I think it's capable of about 80 million cubic feet a day. Um, so that project, when we take a look at it, we actually put nine months in there uh, to get from, you know, testing and we do a, a real decent test, um, and then go from there. The, the question about whether it could be 40 or 50 million cubic feet a day, I, I think really uh, what we're trying to do is take it, take and look for something um, that's analogous to what, uh, is at the Carapel Ridge field. And we know that the Carapel Ridge uh, well initially on day one did about 108 million cubic feet a day with liquids. So those kind of numbers are uh, are certainly 
uh, not out of the realm if, if we find another Carapel Ridge, which is what we're looking for. However, if you look at the engineering report, um, they don't put anything in there anywhere close to that. So, so those numbers would be uh, would certainly be exciting. Part of the reason we want to drill them in the order we want to drill them in, we want to do Corazon or Coho as we're going to refer to it after today, um, is because it's only about three and a half kilometers from the plant, and uh, we think we'd be able to get all those volumes in the plant very quickly, and so we'd get cash flow quickly. And then in the case of uh, BW or um, uh, Cascadura. Um, that would be an oil well, so you'd be able to put tanks right on site and we'd just truck the volume away from there. So the first two would get us cash flow sooner and we could probably have them on stream within, call it six months, uh, would be the plan. So uh, long-winded answer to say, yes, uh, 40 to 50 million cubic feet a day is certainly not out of the question um, if we're successful and, and if we're right. Uh, TXP recently announced that it had suspended development of, exist, of its existing wells. When do you think development will start again and the wells will be completed? Yeah, the, part of the reason we stopped the development drilling, um, really two reasons. One is in December, oil looked like it was heading uh, south again very quickly, and, and we just didn't think it made a lot of sense to, uh, to keep drilling. We knew we were going to get through the 2,000 barrel a day mark, which is, is what we had already done because the wells were performing better than than what the model had, so we kind of pulled back on that. And then we also pulled back because we want to make sure we've got enough cash uh, to drill the exploratory wells. And so, you know, oil, as I mentioned earlier, has is, is really seemed to stabilize in that, well, it's 60, north of 60 range. So right now the board is in the midst of um, reconsidering that. We actually have uh, locations built for three wells um, right now, one at Faisabad, one at WD8, and one at WD4. Um, so we can move again very quickly on that and uh, without kind of committing because I, I don't have the full board approval but the recommendation will be at least uh, to commence here in Q2 with a couple of uh, development wells as well as the exploratory well at Oratwa. So we'll get back at it and then if commodity prices stay strong and and uh, not that I don't have faith in James and the team but we'd really like to see that first well drilled and make sure that it comes in close to budget and then we'll uh, we'll be able to ramp up that program a little bit. So. It's really just managing our capital and, and making sure that we don't have to do any further dilution um, so that we can get everything we can out of all these wells. Um, is TXP still on course to hit 5,000 barrels a day of production target by 2022? Uh, yeah, I would say even without, um, even without the exploration wells, uh, I mean, our goal is still to, uh, to add that. And when you see that we added over 1,000 barrels a day last year with the 11 wells, um, you know, a couple that basically gives us 19, 20, 21, and 22 to to get there. So I, I think with zero exploration success, and as long as commodity prices kind of stay where they are, and we can we can fund a 10 to 15 well development program, um, clearly we're on our way to uh, to getting there. But uh, that could that could change very quickly with with any kind of success at um, at any one of the prospects that we're talking about. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in the in the get go, I mean even cores on it. You know, let's say five, six million a day. That's another thousand BOEs a day of, of net production. So you can see how quickly it changes. Uh, will the money raised in the placing cover drilling of additional wells, uh, like last year, as well as uh, the Oratwa? Yeah. So we raised the money. Um, number one, to, and and the use of proceeds were clearly we want to drill the the exploration wells, but we also have cash flow coming in this year as well. So you you know you've got the the two components together, um, obviously cash flow positive. So you take your cash flow plus the money we raise. That would be more than just drilling two of the wells at Orange Plus. So the additional funds will be used to drill the development wells uh, as we go forward. Um, uh, can you comment on the development in discount in the price of Brent? Uh, what is the discount today compared to a couple of months ago? That's a great question. I, I know this came up last time. And uh, it was really around some of the uncertainty going on in Trinidad between Heritage and Petrotrin as Petrotrin restructured the new company that was taking over or was getting sort of spun out was a company called, they named Heritage that was going to start doing the marketing. As part of that process, they also closed the refinery down in, in Trinidad, which is still closed today, although it's up for sale. It's, it's not processing any, uh, any oil. And the concern was that we may get a larger discount um, we were being told we would get a smaller discount because we'd actually be selling directly into the world market 
and not to a refinery that was basically losing money. Uh, happy to report that uh, towards the end of last year, before the refineries closed down, we were getting about a 16%, one six, 16% discount to Brent. Um, and in January and February, uh, we were in the range of 11 to 12%. It actually moved down uh, as we went uh, as we went uh, month over month. We we haven't seen uh, well, we haven't seen marches. We'll see that in the next two or three weeks. But so certainly that differential has has narrowed down. We've been uh, fully paid by Heritage since they rolled into their new code. Um, they've honored the contracts and paid us quickly. So it's actually worked out uh, worked out really well. Long-winded uh, way to say that we're better off now than we were before the uh, before the uh, restructuring venture trip. Uh, when will the production be able to finance the CapEx program? Um, I, I think right now it, it could if we wanted to just stay on the development uh, side of things, um, certainly at $60, $65. But we really got to drill these wells in order to uh, We have four wells that we have to drill before October of 2020. Um, so uh, I would say that post the drilling of those wells, um, it would certainly uh, certainly fund the program uh, going forward. You know, James talked about there being a, a bunch of follow-up wells if, if we're successful. Um, that is a problem that I'm really happy to deal with. Uh, you know, we don't mind borrowing money for facilities and pipelines and those kind of things. And on the drilling side, we either want to use cash flow um, cash flow or, or equity, and that's why we raise the equity is we want to drill these exploratory wells. Although they're lower risk exploratory wells, we want to drill them with equity versus debt. We just, we just uh, you know, our feeling is um, it doesn't make sense to risk, uh, sort of risk the company on the exploratory wells. We would rather take a more conservative approach on that. Um, uh, how much do you expect it will cost to drill the first well at Ortois? So, so this has come uh, this has come a long ways from a uh, from a uh, uh, best guess um, to where we actually have gone out to full bids now for construction, multiple bids for construction. We've already picked the uh, the bidder on the construction side, so we know what that is. Um, we know the rig we're going to use. We've got the day rate. We've got mud, mud loggers, all that. We've got it all sort of firmed up now. And that's just over three million dollars. I think it's three million and eighty-three thousand uh, U.S. Uh, for the first well. And there, there's a fairly large contingency built into that, so it could be less if we uh, if we if we hit it right on the nail. So um, that's that's the cost of the first well. The second well will be right in that same range, might be a hundred thousand or something for a little longer road, but but that would be it. And that's the other reason why we want to kind of. Be careful about this development drilling program. We'd like to get one of these wells behind us and just make sure that we we have the capital we need to, to drill the other wells as we go forward. Uh, the Royston well will be a little bit a uh, little bit deeper, and the road in is about a six month construction. Uh, so it's it's more likely, although we don't have as firm a quote on it, is probably in the range of five five and a half million dollars. But you know, you talk about the prize, and the the prize is. Uh, is extremely large on that one, so it certainly offsets the risk. During the full year, net debt rose by 11.5 million. Do you expect that it will grow again in 2019? If so, by how much? Um, no, and, and it really grew in, in 2018 because we, we did the $22 million capital program and only brought in 10 million. So the, the difference is really um, is really what it, you know, that's that's where the, the debt number comes in. Uh, it uh, you know it was a ramped up program. So what's going to happen this year though is we'll end up with more cash flow because we've got more production. And I think you can hear me throughout this presentation talking about how we want to manage uh, the capital allocation so that it doesn't grow anymore. And um, that's that's basically what. And we've also had cash flow now for you know you look at January, February, and March. We haven't really spent any capital. And I know James will put me in the arm here because he'd love to be out there drilling. But but uh, part of that has been to pay some of that down. Plus, we also raised another, you know, six and a half million Canadian here last month. So, um, you know, we want to stay conservative on the balance sheet, uh, clearly, in what we do. And our our goal is to be at about 1.5 times debt to cash flow. And I think we creeped up to about 1.8. But uh, take a look at it at the end of Q1, and I think everybody will be pretty happy that we're we're doing what we said we would do. Um, what is the is the chan I, COS, I'm assuming that's a uh, chance of success for each of the Oratoire wells. Are you confident on success? Um, 
Yeah, I don't want to jinx it here. I don't, I, I you know, I think, I, I think we've, what we've tried to do is balance the risk versus the reward. So we're staying as close as we can to wells that we know have either tested or shows of hydrocarbon. Um, at the same time, what we want to do is use the 3D seismic to make sure the bottom hole locations are in the optimal place from what we see on the reservoir. So, um, you know, you go through it, and, and I don't necessarily disagree with what GLJ did. I, I think there's, you know, 90 90% chance of success that we're going to get hydrocarbon out of coho. Um, you know, what are going to be the rates and what's the size of the pool? We won't know that till after we've done some testing. I think when you look at the oil prospect again, you know, we're staying close to a well that's already produced uh, roughly 20,000 barrels. So we've eliminated that particular piece of it. Uh, the real excitement on that is if, if the technical team is right in that, that bottom sheet is a is a, a repeat of the, the the upper sheet, you know that that becomes really significant. So, um, and on the Royston side, uh, you know it's to be honest with you that that particular well is really exponential. It's either it's either huge or um, uh, something on the uh, something on the logs, you know, has has given us the wrong indication of of, of what's there. Um, so we're either really right or really wrong, and it would be the lowest chance of success, but it's obviously the biggest reward as well. James, do you have any other comments on that that you would say? Yeah, I mean, notwithstanding what, what Paul said, if you wanted to get into kind of the specifics that GLJ used, I think on both the Coho well and on the Cascadero well, they are uh, ranked in the 90 to 95% chance of success and chance of commerciality, which was bringing it actually on stream. Uh, for Royston and the deeper exploration wells that don't have that associated production, you're going to, the range that GLJ came up with is somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 37% chance of success. And that really is based on just a question about whether or not the trap is present and whether it is a ceiling trap and if the reservoir quality is enough to give you a commercial discovery. Each of those uh, on their own are in the 60 to 80% chance of success, but when you multiply the three of them together, you wind up with that, that 35% range. James and I are sitting there with our fingers crossed because we don't want to jinx anything on this. Uh, you know, it is still exploration. I think that should be really clear. We're we're testing a new geological model, um, but the key thing that we want to do, and it really talks about managing the capital here, is is we want to make sure our core business is still running uh, better than it ever has. That we're continuing to drill the development wells, and and we're not risking the company on the exploratory wells. You know, I would argue even with the share price the way it is. Uh, in the last couple of months, really, the the company is being valued at the development side, and the expiration is really a, a free option at this point, and um, which is a great way to great way to have it. Uh, another question that was submitted by a shareholder in advance: uh, How do you find Trinidad as a jurisdiction in which to operate, given some other London listed stocks seem to be having experienced a couple of problems in the region? Uh, you know, I, I can't really talk for the other companies. I know. Um, we did get a late payment, for instance, uh, when the Petrotrin heritage uh, uh, transition took place. So we didn't we have, we're we're sort of hanging out over the end of the year for six million dollars, uh, but we did get paid that. So you know, happy happy that that all got sorted out. I think the new management at Heritage has a, a really refreshing attitude. Um, you know, they want to work with us. Uh, we've had uh, one meeting in particular, a very lengthy meeting sort of deciding on how to move forward and, and it really felt like a partnership. Um, it was how do we get the most oil out of the ground over the next 20 years uh, and and how do we move forward as a partner and, and make that work, which um, I can honestly say we hadn't had that discussion before. And so that's really exciting and, and it's a great opportunity for us. So we'll, we'll do that. Uh, I, I don't think, um, I don't think I really have much else to comment on. I mean, uh, the transition we got some of the regulate uh, some of our approvals were maybe a couple of days slower than what we had hoped, but but generally speaking, and you can see it from the production at 2,200 barrels a day that, that we've been able to move forward uh, fairly quickly. So um, I'm optimistic. I think the government made some very very difficult decisions closing down the refinery, bringing in an outsider to run the new entity. Um, but you know, uh, somebody with great oil and gas knowledge, and and I just think um, I just think it's pretty exciting time for Trinidad, and and for the first time in a long time, I, I think they may be optimistic that they can actually grow oil production in Trinidad as well. 
Uh, next question is, how many wells will be drilled in the development program in 2019? And if you succeed at Corazon, when will you drill the next wells there? Uh, I'll take the second half of the question first. Uh, if we're successful at Corazon, uh, what we'll do is the rig's going to slide over to BW5 or Cascadura immediately because we want to run a good long test, try to determine the size of the pool at, at Corazon. Um, and then if it if it justifies uh, tying it in, we'll obviously tie it in, in fairly quickly. As far as the development program in 2019, I know everybody's been trying to nail me down on that one. And I think what we'll do is we'll probably go to the board initially uh, with a four well program. And just like we did last year, if we're successful, commodity prices stay strong uh, and, and uh, cash flow continues the way it is, we would add additional wells on between now and the end of the year. Um, if you're asking me what it would look like in a perfect world, in a perfect world, we drill Corazon, uh, we drill BW5, we do the road construction on, uh, on Royston so it was ready to go in Q4 or Q1 of next year, and we drill 10 development wells between now and the end of the year. So that's, that's what I'm working towards, and all we need to do is uh, we just got to make sure the money's there. So Scott and I need to balance that, uh, that timing as we go forward on the capital. I uh, mentioned IPs of 90 barrels a day on new wells in 2018. How have these help, held up and what was the decline observed? You know, it's a really, really, it's a really good question and, it, and it's a really tough one. Because um, our range of, of production out of, uh, out of the new wells is all over the map. It's, uh, you know, low end would be 15 barrels a day, James, to uh, highs of 350 barrels a uh, day, flowing oil wells. And, um, so when I threw out that 90, what I really was was just taking the 11 wells and dividing it by the, the thousand barrels a day that are coming out of out of those uh, 11 wells today. Um, so it's more statistical. And again, on the decline side, um, we build in our model that they declined by 36 percent in the first year, 24 the second year, and then and then 12 percent after that. But again, um, you know, our independent engineers have had a, had a really hard time on a couple of the wells because they've either been flat or some of them have actually been going up um, as we put pumps in the hole and, and other things like that. So I think the best answer to this is we need to use a statistical average uh, to give us, uh, us good data. But as the team's finding new fault blocks, new ways to drill, new ways to produce these things, hopefully that statistical average will, will move up. Anything you want to add to that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we've seen with these new wells. Um, if we go back to when we first spoke with the folks here and, uh, about our aim listing two years ago, production was about 1,250 barrels a day, and we've really, we've, we've darn near doubled that in 24 months. And what's changed now is I would say that 70% uh, of our production really is represented now by about 20 wells. Uh, the majority of them being the wells we've drilled in the last uh, two years. So we really have seen a, a transformation where we've gone from a five barrel a day or a 10 barrel a day average up to, as Paul said, about 90 barrel a day average. And we're not seeing the decline we're expecting, which is a good thing, but it's taking an awful lot of, like, it takes a lot of effort to do that. It takes a lot of attention and, and it's something that we've been able to uh, kind of pin down over the last three or four years with our own experience and, and minimize that decline as best we can. Um, uh, what is current production? Uh, 2,200 barrels a day uh, is the simple answer to that. Uh, there's always a little difference between uh, current production and sales at the end of the month, depending on what day sales fall on. Um, but uh, we think that we should be between sales this month should be between 2,100 and uh, 2,100 and 2,200, maybe 2,150 to 2,200 somewhere in that range. So that's uh, that's where we're at today. Any news about the SPT? Lots of activity lately in Trinity, in Trinidad uh, lately regarding this. Um, the, the news on the ST is exactly the same as it's been for the last four years. Uh, lots of talk about it, nothing getting done. Uh, ask me my opinion. My opinion would be that nothing gets done until after the next election, which is October of 2020. Um, that's the assumption that we're making. And uh, I think we're just going to run our business accordingly, which means, you know, we can drill development wells. We can use those, those tax pools to deduct against the SPT. Um, I just don't see how the government can go through the restructuring that they went through, the Petrotrin, 
and then uh, give what is perceived as a tax break to the uh, to the oil producers on the island. I, I just think politically um, that doesn't make a lot of sense. However, I think what they can do is uh, oh, once they get an, a strong mandate, whoever that may be, um, after the next election, then they can look at how are they going to improve the fiscal terms. So um, I, I know it's not the answer that anybody wants to hear, but I think it's the honest answer, which is don't count on the SPT to make a big difference um, as you go forward here. I think I think it is what it is for a while. Uh, is the debt repayment schedule likely to be rolled uh, over in the future? Uh, short answer to that again is yes. It's about this time of year. We try to get it done before the end of March so that we don't have to move uh, long-term debt up our current line. And um, uh, we're in that process right now, and I just I can't comment any further on that. As soon as we've got something, we'll uh, obviously let everybody know. But but um, y you know we've got a co great lenders um, certainly on on our side that have worked with us, and quite frankly, they you know the way that deal is structured, they get eight percent coupon, but they also get a one percent gore. And with the new production volumes that we have. Um, they're very happy with uh, with obviously the uh, uh, the gore that they get on a monthly basis. So it's a, it's an excellent relationship, but I can't I can't comment until we have that that uh, that done. But that has always been our plan is to roll these out on a yearly basis so that the principals uh, pushed out per year, which is what we did last year. Uh, and I, I think this is going to be the last question. We'll try to keep these to 45 minutes. What are the long-term plans for the ore power block? Should the drilling be successful? Uh, example, farm out development partner. Um, I would say it's one out of the three of those. Uh, if we're successful at ore, I, I can't see us farming it out. I think at that point, um, you know, we're going to have a bunch of options on, on how we can develop it, um, either through uh, cash flow or... Uh, looking at expanding the line of credit, certainly for pipelines and facilities. Um, you know, if, if, if the kind of success happens that we're talking about, and I know somebody asked that question about how big, uh, let's say, Royston could be, you know, if you borrow the money to put in a gas a pipeline and you got a $40 million a day um, gas well, you, you have what I will refer to as a wall of cash coming at you um, in order to finance the rest of your program, and, and that's... That's clearly what we would see, and that's why we're taking sort of this pragmatic approach in drilling these wells. If we really want to take our time, uh, and I would hate to farm out the upside because that's really what you would be doing at that point. As far as a partner goes, um, you know, we, we've had some discussion uh, with various partners out there. We will end up with a partner because the Crown Corporation Heritage uh, is our 20% partner in the block. They automatically get 20% but they're carried on the first four wells. So we've got 100 to earn 80, and then after that, uh, they are our partner, and they have to participate in all the costs. So in essence, we already do have a partner. And we just kind of like operating and driving the bus on our own, and I guess maybe we don't play well with others, but um, our plan would be not to partner that up and just uh, flip it up. And long-term, um, you know, I think long-term, Ortois is going to be a heart of the development program for touchstone uh, going forward in, in 2020 and beyond, but I think it could also be the development uh, program for Trinidad as a country. I think that whole southwestern area, and you know, there's lots of players along that that trend, right? You've got Trinity, you've got Range, you've got uh, Columbus all have land along that trend. So, you know, if we can prove up this new geological model, I think it's not only a good thing for us and maybe some of the other players, but it's a great thing for the country uh, going forward as well. So on that note, I'm going to wrap it up, and uh, I just want to thank everybody that's uh, that's logged in or is is watching this. Uh, thanks, James, for sharing the time. It was uh, it was good. And um, our website uh, presentations on the website. There's also a general information uh, email on the website. If you send that into the general information, I get those uh, daily. So please don't hesitate to reach out, and we'll uh, we'll provide you with as much information as we can. So thank you very much, and have a good evening.